Hi. Um, today I'm going to talk about our work titled Clockwork Finance Automated Analysis of Economic Security in Smart Contracts. This is joint work with Phil Dayan, Mahimna Kelkar, and Ari Jules at Cornell University. So recent years have seen meteoric rise of DeFi, with these DeFi applications handling billions of dollars. Uh, and this meteoric rise has been facilitated by innovations in smart contracts. These smart contracts really execute like clockwork. What I mean by that? The smart contracts execute in sequential and atomic transactions. This execution is deterministic, and most blockchains have transparent execution of these smart contracts. Therefore, this has enabled easy interoperability between the smart contracts and also has enabled to uh, build novel financial instruments. You often see this notion of money legos where DeFi applications smoothly interact with each other, and this interaction admittedly has been increasingly more and more complex. Now, I just want to focus on one application, not even the interaction of multiple applications, and want to highlight how it causes unintended behavior that was not originally envisioned in these applications. So consider a decentralized exchange application with which a user is interacting. The user wants to swap some US dollars into ETH. This decentralized exchange is obviously running on smart contracts, and the behavior dictates that whenever the user wants to buy ETH, the price of ETH would increase on their DEX. Now, any miner that's observing this transaction can actually front run this transaction. So the miner buys the ETH before the user, and then they flips back and sells the ETH after the user. Because the user's transaction increased the price of ETH, the miner actually, using the sandwich attack, profits off the user. Here I have uh, some symbolic variables, as in swap X and swap Y. That will become more clear. Uh, these, the actual profit by the miner actually depends on what values this X and Y take. This is captured by the notion of the umbrella term called MEV, which is minor extractable value or maximal extractable value. This is roughly the value that a miner can extract by reordering, censoring, or inserting new transactions. Now, as I mentioned, the contract composition has been really on the rise, and these interactions have been more and more complex. Some of the examples are interactions of flash loans with decentralized exchanges, lending contracts using decentralized exchanges as like price oracles to basically price their debts, flash loans with governance contracts. So most of the governance contracts require you to stake some capital, and flash loans make it easier to acquire that capital. And of course, the composition of a lot of decentralized exchanges as well. So this complex interaction of smart contracts actually leads to unintended behaviors, not just in one contract, but because of this interaction. There has been lots of hacks that you see in the news regularly. This is just some screenshots from the past few months of millions of dollars being drained because we do not really understand how these interactions happen. These attacks range anywhere from Oracle manipulation attacks, as I talked about the Oracle prices in a lending contract, to interactions of flash loans with other applications. There's actually an industry around this entire unintended behavior, and this figure really captures the rise of that industry. So, so far there has been at least $600 million being extracted through this uh, unintended behavior, and really this is only the tip of the tip of the iceberg. There's the actual MEV estimate is considerably orders of magnitudes higher than this figure. So in order to study this behavior and study MEV rigorously, the existing techniques for studying security uh, really fall insufficient. These techniques can range anywhere from manual human auditing to first testing static analysis of your code for, for like vulnerable patterns in the code and formal verification of the functional correctness of the application. However, the common theme among these uh, techniques is all of them focus on either bug hunting or functional correctness of the program or like some secret uh, leakage, like leakage of some private secret key. In this work, we go beyond this notion of security and directly reason about the economic behavior of these applications and their interactions 
by leveraging existing techniques of formal verification, which were earlier just used for functional correctness. And note that unlike traditional finance, DeFi applications run on these smart contracts, which are deterministic, sequential, atomic, and transparent. This allows for formal verification of their behavior. The traditional finance instruments are typically opaque, not even deterministic, let alone transparent. So benefits to the ecosystem because of our work are several folds to different players in the ecosystem. First, developers can actually prove bounds on the MEV that's exposed by their contracts and the interaction of their contracts with other contracts. Users can use this work to actually analyze the MEV that's extractable from the transactions that they're about to make. And of course, consensus researchers are also interested in MEV, and this framework provides them to study MEV rigorously because MEV actually destabilizes consensus as well. Here's the outline for the rest of the talk. I'm first gonna talk about some of the definitional tools, and then I'm gonna talk about the practical instantiation of these definitions into something that we call clockwork finance framework. Now on to the definitions. Believe it or not, there was not even a definition of MEV before uh, we defined it in our paper. So I'm gonna talk about the MEV definition and what it means to have secure composition. So minor extractable value definition is basically parameterized on a starting state S and player balances, especially we are considered with the balance of the minor. Now the miner can produce any valid block and gain some profit in the process. So the green bars uh, adjacent to the piggy banks represent the balance of the miner. And MEV is the maximum value that you can gain from producing such valid blocks. Now this definition can be generalized to any player and any number of blocks that you, that you can produce on top of the state S. So any player P that gains some profit in the sequence of valid blocks B1, B2, B3 here, extract some profit, and this definition is uh, formally specified in our paper where we define action spaces of the players and how much balance uh, increment they have during this sequence of blocks. And extractable value here is the maximum profit that you can get from any sequence of valid blocks. Now note that for our purposes, rather than reasoning about any player P, it's actually sufficient to just reason about the miners. Because in some sense, miners are the most powerful actors in the system. They control the ordering of the transactions, which transactions get included in the blocks. So it's really enough to just reason about minor extractable value, and in some sense, it subsumes all the other attacks. So now that we know what, how we measure economic security in terms of MEV, now we define what it means for contracts to compose securely. So as before, you start from a state S and you get some MEV by producing some valid blocks. And if you have a new contract C, then you have a new state S prime that is basically S included with the contract C. And the MEV that you can extract from the new state S prime, if that is more than the MEV that you were able to extract without this contract in the original state, then we say that the new contract C actually secu composes securely with the uh, original state. And if you can extract more MEV, then we say it's, it doesn't compose securely. There are more parameters in this definition. I would encourage you to look in the paper for formal definition. Now, now that we have these definitions of what it means to have economic security and what it means to have secure composition, I'm gonna talk about how we use these definitions to implement a practical tool for proving these bounds on MEV. So I'm first gonna talk about the design of the tool then I'm gonna talk about how we use them for proofs and also for finding attacks. So just to start with a brief overview of formal verification at a high level, consider the program that's represented by this abstract syntax tree, where you start from a state S and you want to verify the property, property blue, right? What we want is that this property holds in all the states, end states of the program. So there are three end states of the program, and if all those states satisfy this property, then the formal verification should give you a proof of the, uh, of the property being held in these, all these end states. However, if one of these end states actually violates your property, then formal verification actually gives you a counterexample 
which is a trace from your program. So it's a concrete trace for a concrete uh, execution of the program path. So analogous to this small example that I showed you for formal verification, Clockwork Finance Framework is instantiated similarly. So we start from a blockchain state S, which has certain contracts in it and certain balances of the players. Given some symbolic transactions, so by symbolic transactions, I mean that these transactions can actually be parameterized on some input variables. So suppose transaction two and three are user transactions, which are concrete. Transaction one could be transaction inserted by the miner, which says, I want to swap X ETH for Y USD. There are some preconditions on X and Y, namely X and Y should be greater than zero. And now we want to verify the property that MEV is less than some bound delta. What is happening under the hood behind the Clockwork Finance Framework is it's basically reasoning about all the paths, which means all the reorderings of these transactions. And then it says that whether the MEV on each of these paths, if that's less than delta, then I would give you a proof. If it's not less than delta, for example, in the first path where you execute transaction one, two, and three, it will actually give you a counterexample trace. And in some sense, that's like an MEV strategy. In order to do this formal verification, we leverage existing tools. As I said before, we use K-Framework, which basically gives you all these tools that, that are highlighted here for free if you provide a language definition for it. So we, we provide the language definition that's in the yellow box, and then we get parsers, compilers, verifiers for the program that are written in those languages for free. Some more nice things about this framework are it has human readable specifications of these languages, and also Ethereum virtual machine specification has been specified formally in the language of the framework, which is the K language. Now, all that remains for us to actually define this language, and then we can make use of all the nice properties of K framework. So the CFF language model consists of first, the codified CF definitions of what it means to have some MEV after some transaction execution and what it means to have secure composition. Second, we of course need the smart contracts that we are analyzing. And third, we need the EVM semantics to actually execute transactions on those smart contracts. Once you specified this language definition, you give it to the verifier, and the verifier will either give you a proof that the MEV is less than some bound, or it will give you a counterexample. Now, in order to make this practical, because in order to reason about all these paths through complex smart contract execution, we need to do some simplification for the smart contract code. So we replace the smart contract code with something that we call CFF models. These CFF models are in some sense simplifications of the smart contract code, albeit with some properties that I'm going to describe now. So the CFF models are really over approximations of smart contract code. What that means is any path that you have in the smart contract code also exists in CFF models, but the converse may not be true. What that means is CFF models, when you execute this Cloudcock Finance Framework with CFF models rather than smart contract code, there might be some paths, namely the third path here, which actually gives you MEV because all the paths are here, but it might not be actually realizable because we did some simplifications, and this path actually does not exist in smart contract. So in some sense, this is really a false positive and there are no false negatives. Now, how do we do this simplification? The simplification process is largely manual, although we specify, we give some hints in the paper as to how you can automate this uh, translation. If the contract has been already formally verified, you can actually simplify this process of manual translation. So this is this code for Uniswap v1, where you're swapping some, to, some ETH to token. Now, notice that this smart contract code has a bunch of things, first, it has some things like deadlines about your transactions that we don't really care about for our MEV analysis. So we cross that off, we prune that path. It has some limitations on how many tokens you need to buy at a minimum. We don't really care about those, I mean, because these really increase the number of paths that you need to explore through smart contract. What we really care about is the core functionality of the contract. And because of pruning of these paths, we obtain the simplified CFF models. 
We also open source some CFF modules for Uniswap V1, Uniswap V2, MakerDAO, Flash loans, airdrops. As I mentioned, CFF models actually introduce some false positives, but these false positives are easy to prune away because they really give you a counterexample strategy of MEV. So whatever false positives that you get of the MEV strategies, you can actually run them on an archive node and prune out all those false positives. And finally, what you have after this validation are actual strategies that you can execute. There are more scaling optimizations for making CFF practical. These optimizations can be categorized into two categories. The first one is the general optimizations, and the second one is contract-specific optimizations. So the first general optimization that we do is the transaction. You don't really need to reorder all the transactions because transactions for a sender should really be serialized by the nonces of the sender. So in some sense, if you explore all the reorderings, most of them would be invalid orderings. Second, the contracts that do not really interact with each other, you can consider them as e generating equivalent reorderings. And the third, in practice, we observe that if you randomize your exploration of these reorderings, it actually gives you much better convergence or much better speed up in finding higher and higher values of MEV. And for Uniswap like AMMs, it's generally known that reordering these transactions gives you the same final state that means the, it's actually path independent, so you don't really need to explore all the reorderings. Now on to evaluation of CFF on real world data. This graph represents the seven day moving average of MEV per block in different AMMs. We take 1,000 random samples in each month and measure the MEV. And the MEV is largely uh, very spiky in nature but roughly it has the value of roughly around 0.4 ETH per block. We also have evaluations for compositions. So in this experiment, we slot in the Uniswap price for the Maker Oracle price. Although Maker uses some other price methods, but this is an experiment to illustrate composability. Here we again run CFF on historical data and plot the highest observed MEV blocks when you actually use Uniswap as the Oracle price in Maker. Just to give an intuition of why this composition experiment is important, if you use Uniswap price in Maker, you can actually manipulate the Uniswap price and then liquidate some positions on MakerDAO and gain some profits. We have many more CFF evaluations on different kinds of contracts, governance contracts, flash loans, airdrops. I would encourage you to have a look at the paper. Finally, in conclusion, we initiated the study of formal behavior, we form, initiated the formal study of economic behavior of smart contracts through the lens of MEV. We provided definitions of what MEV is and what it means to have secure composition of contracts. We instantiated these definitions into a practical proof system based on formal verification. And developers can use CFF to find bounds on the MEV that their contracts expose, and users can actually use them to study how much MEV their transactions are exposing. With that, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. So I have a question. You can line up at this microphone or this microphone. Um, I have a question to start. Does this exclude any MEV that comes from off-chain arbitrage? This is the MEV from being able to be the first trade in a block when the price is changed on another on a centralized exchange? Yeah, in some sense, the, uh, the centralized exchange arbitrage is if you're making profits, they would not be captured here. So it's, it's just like atomic on-chain arbitrage, yeah. basically. Uh, either atomic or it could be multi-block as well. Right, right. But if, that pro if those profits are actually realized on-chain, then it would reflect in the definitions. Right. Makes sense. What's the, what's the time frame required for this tooling, and what's your thought on the risks of um, this kind of these systems being built out and... Um, across like really efficient compute clusters and people using generalized strategies to automatically do formally verify and find any of these strategies? Uh, I couldn't hear that clearly. Could you repeat your question? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, how long does this take to run? And what are your thoughts on the risks of someone scaling a very efficient compute cluster to basically do these methods and search for MEV that they, like search for MEV through these methods? Yeah, I mean, for, this, for the second part, I'd answer that first. All of these tools are actually both defensive and offensive in nature. So if you can actually 
do parallelization in real time uh, finding of MEV that can be used by bots. Um, so that's the answer to your second part. For the first part, I actually have some uh, bonus slides. Um, so these are the proving times and the running times of CFF. So on, on left, you actually see the time it takes to execute the transactions, just execute transactions. So execute 400, um, roughly 40,000 transactions in around hundreds of seconds. And the, on the right, you have proving times when you can actually parallelize the proving across many, uh, plus many threads. Um, as you can see, this proving uh, is really embarrassingly parallel. There are so many paths that you need to explore, and most of them are independent. So you can actually parallelize this. We did this experiment over a cluster with 80 cores, and uh, the proving times really depend on how many transactions you are exploring. So for a sandwich attack, these transactions would be three. Uh, for more complex attacks, there would be more transactions. But uh, these are the transactions that we explore, seven, eight, and nine. More than nine transactions, it becomes very hard to prove anything about them. Um, awesome, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, could you speak to the possibility of uh, proving whether or not um, the path dependence has any impact or, or affirmatively knowing that certain tests you can run on a state dependent function will actually deliver the correct results? Can we confirmatively know um, state dependence and path independence on smart contracts? So if I understand your question correctly, you're asking whether we can figure out whether some smart contracts have path independence and some smart contracts do not have path independence. Yes, because that seems particularly relevant in the case uh, of knowing certain results will be delivering uh, false positives, and you'd want to know if they are path dependent or not. Yeah, so for example, Uniswap, it's well known that it has path independence. Yeah. But for other contracts, if they do have path independence, it becomes easier to just slot in that optimization, not explore the reorderings. Uh, but for the protocols that we consider, the other protocols do not have path independence. Like for example, Maker, if you're actually doing liquidations, but there's some top up of the collateral before the liquidation, you can't really reorder them. So um, that's, that's kind of orthogonal to the uh, actual design of the framework. Okay, thanks. Hi there. Um, I guess I'm curious, it sounds like when you're uh, when you're going through, I guess, the tree of the formal verification, you're, you're looking for counterexamples where MEV is over some threshold. How in K are you encoding the idea? Like, how are you encoding that there is some MEV? Is it just that additional transactions can be inserted that, that lead to some profit? Or, like, how do you encode that in K? Right. So um, the, the tricky bit here is you have to specify some template of the transactions that you want to insert. Mm -hmm. Right. So once you specify that template, MEV, as you can see here, is actually a function of those input parameters. Right? And then the framework would actually give this function to a solver which says whether this function is less than delta. Yeah. Right? So you have to specify those templates. And the subtle bit here is basically these insertions can be really arbitrary. So a transaction insertion could be create a new contract. Right? Create a new contract x where x is some variable. So those are like intractable insertions, and the, the framework would just say, I'm timing out. I don't know how many paths to explore, what all to actually do, right? So um, you have to specify some templates of insertion. So here we explore some kinds of templates for Uniswap, and for Maker, like liquidate some positions, top up some collateral, but it really depends on what transactions you're inserting. Got it. So when you're talking about that, that protocols could think about bounds on MEV, it would be bounds of a certain subset of typical forms of MEV, not all MEV. Yeah, so it will be cool. basically parameterized on the kinds of transactions that you're inserting and the number of transactions that you're inserting. So the bounds that you have, like the MEV is less than delta, that would basically be MEV is less than delta for nine transactions where these transactions follow this template. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I just had a quick question about ways where maybe the, the user of CFF can like, speed up the process. Are there things that you can specify where like, hey, you know, I think that this property should hold and I'd like CFF to prove it first so that it like, 
um, you know, so that it's fast related, like path independence, for example. Um, like if you were to input like arbitrary smart contracts into this. Um, or another example is like, oh, you know, I think that like the, the space of orderings of the transactions is actually much smaller than all permutations. You know, it's maybe, you know, one transaction always has to be first or something. Um, are those things that can be specified with the system? Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question. So the question is, can you speed up the verification by actually providing some guidance to the tool? So uh, in, in this framework, we focused on automating everything and just having the translation from smart contract code to CFF models uh, manual. But with every, every for formula verification, there's some manual component if you want to speed up things. So um, what you can really do is like specify some invariants of the code. Uh, this is uh, a little bit like in the, into the weeds of formal verification, but for example, if you're verifying something like curve finance, and curve finance has loops about um, actually executing the transaction. So the actual function has some loops inside it. So then to, uh, in order to reason about those properties, you have to provide some loop invariant to the framework so that it can, it can efficiently find out the uh, you know, execution of those symbolic transactions. If you don't find, give it the loop invariant, it will just try to figure it out automatically will try a lot of things until it finds a right invariant. So yeah, you, you could provide it some guidance, and that's actually one very promising area of like scaling it by orders of magnitude. Yeah. Thanks. I'm wondering if you have data on the expected MEV with this, as you scale the number of transactions, as in um, when you have seven transactions versus eight transactions versus nine transactions, how much better can you really do with MEV? Is there sense in going to 15 transactions, 20 transactions, et cetera? Right. Um, I think in the paper we have some graphs on uh, MEV in different types of blocks. So we have two kinds of blocks. One is tractable blocks and one is intractable blocks. Tractable blocks have transactions less than nine and intractable um, more than that. But we don't really notice a pattern where you have more transactions, you get more MEV because it really depends on what those transactions are. Like if there's just one transaction that's millions of dollars of trade, that already gives you a lot of MEV. So. Thank you. Thanks. That concludes our session.